notes, but I won't read too much. Kol thrash tutsta ipastid chad to aslada ati if basquit. Swawatiktid, the busu chibiti buhu chad da kwati tob swatiktid, a shamasquim atsatsil tabib. So I wanted to start the way that my teachers taught me to start. My name's Cole Thrush. Um, I'm a settler. I'm from a place, uh, used to be called Slaughter. It's now called Auburn, Washington, about an hour outside of Seattle. And uh, in Musque or in Muckleshoot territory. And uh, the language I was speaking there was their language that I learned when I worked for the tribe. It's called the Shootseed. It's related to Hunkaminam. Um, and I said I raised my hands to people in this territory of the Musqueam people. Yes, and it's so excited that uh, it's exciting that we have I don't know more in Musqueam now in Hunkaminam. It's very cool. So I wanted to thank Sam um, and Jesse and all the others um, that asked me to speak today. It's quite an honor to be asked to speak. I'm a professor in the history department. My office is on the 12th floor over there, so I'd be up there looking at this too, if nothing else. Um, so I wanted to actually ask us to begin in a slightly different way, um, and I'd like to begin with some silence. Um, I think it's really important at events like this and in movements like this that we take some time to think about what it is that brought us here. Um, the people that worked very hard to give us the space to be able to do this, whose land we're on, the people who are with us here, the people who are not with us anymore or can't be with us here. So let's just take a moment to just be silent with that. Thanks. So silence is powerful. Back in the late 80s and early 90s when I was a university student, I began my schooling as an activist during an epidemic that was killing my community, in particular my elders. A whole generation of gay men were being wiped out by a disease whose name our president would not even say in public. Grassroots organizations like Queer Nation and ACT UP or the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power developed a slogan, silence equals death. And this is what we chanted in the streets, this is what we chanted in the churches, this is what we chanted in the legislatures. Silence equals death. And like any historian, my job is ultimately to translate for the dead. And in a lot of cultures, this is a sacred responsibility um, rather than just a job. And as a settler person who has worked with and for indigenous communities and alongside indigenous colleagues like Charles and Glenn and others, it's my job to speak into the silence, not for indigenous people, but with. And silence is what we have in Canada. I cannot tell you how many times I've had students, um, including people who are here, um, who have come to me after class, shocked that they did not know about what I was telling them in class, about the residential schools, about the missing and murdered women, the unseated status of the land that we're standing on right now. And of course they didn't know. We live in a society that is in denial about its own history. Canada happily points out violence to the South and the United States <clears throat> while ignoring the ongoing everyday violence faced here by indigenous men, women, and children. Harper tells the G8 that Canada has no history of colonialism and then a few months later apologizes for the residential schools. This is some serious cognitive dissonance. This is some serious silence. And just as we did back in the 80s and 90s during the height of the epidemic in my community, my students, when they realize that they have what they haven't been told, often get angry. And we should get angry. Not only because of what happens to vulnerable people in our society and the rights that are being ignored and trampled, but because those of us who are not indigenous are also not served by this silence. We should be angry that we don't know the story in which we find ourselves, and that we don't know even basic things about where we live, who we live with, and what should be done. Now, this question of anger is an interesting one. Stephen Harper's silence, to go back to silence, around the Idle No More movement has been pretty deafening. And one of the only public statements he's made so far, a few weeks ago, was this. He said, people have the right in our country to demonstrate and express their points of view peacefully as long as they obey the law. But I think the Canadian population expects everyone will obey the law in holding such protests. What he's saying basically here is, is this. Indians are scary, especially when they're mad. And the real Canadians, the real Canadians, want them to follow the rules. And this is what I've been asked on radio shows, and when I've been asked about this in public, is what do they want? You know, how bad is this going to get? Is this going to? People are, are frightened by this movement. But my experience at events, and this is what I talk about with people who have not been to Idle No More events, is the emphasis on peace, the emphasis on conversation, 
the emphasis on a sharing of responsibility, but also of traditions, and that's been what we've been hearing all day today. And people who have not been to these events often don't know that. And so that's part of, I feel like, my role. Um, so this is an, I don't know more is not a threat so much as an invitation. Um, it's an invitation to learn, to come to rallies like this, to the Teach-In Tomorrow at the Longhouse. Apparently there are over 300 people already saying they're coming, so get a seat early. It's a chance to like the Facebook pages, read the website, sign the petitions, listen to the songs, be silent for the prayers. And it's also an invitation to speak into the silence. A recent CBC poll found that around two-thirds of Canadians were aware of the Idle No More movement. This is great news. It's rare that non-Indigenous Canadians give Aboriginal people any thought at all, so this is a big step forward. The problem is that half of those two-thirds think about the movement negatively. No surprise there, the media would rather have us focus on the accounting practices of one First Nation versus the poverty faced by Aboriginal communities all across Canada. They would have us focus on, on blockades, which get framed as terrorism, rather than on resource extraction. Um, and the ways that those resources come out of Aboriginal territories. <clears throat> those one-third of Canadians who see this movement as a bad thing have been told a very different, di very different story than the one we've been telling here, and this means we have work to do. This means we need to learn to speak to each other and to those who are not on board. One way to do this is to carry the messages that you learn at events like this, to come up with to those of us who are speaking here today or to the organizers and ask us questions and figure out how to make the message of Idle No More work within your own networks of friends, family, and community because those communities need to care about this too. They need to care about Harper's attacks on democracy and on the environment and on our neighbors. And I also want to invite you to bring your own history into this. Whether your family has been here for seven generations or seven years, learn how your story is part of the bigger one we were all talking about here. And I want you to bring your own uh, traditions of peaceful resistance, social justice and liberation, and bring those to the table too. We all have these traditions, even if they're often hidden from us too. Think back to the leaders who freed your home country from colonial control, the visionaries who imagined a better life for your ancestors, the activists who engaged in righteous struggle. We all have these. And in the last few months, I've been studying the, the writings of a woman who lived nine centuries ago along the Rhine River uh, between Germany and France. Her name was Hildegard of Bingen, and she was a religious leader, a physician, an artist, a composer, and a general badass. And she had this to say to those in power um, in her day, in sermons that were heard by my ancestors. She had this to say to a pope that was forcing one vision of God onto all people. She had this to say to greedy emperors who amassed their own wealth while the poor suffered. She had this to say to kings who sent their own people to die in distant wars. She had this to say. She said, you leaders are like ones in the throes of death. You will be so shaken that the strength of your feet, the feet on which you now stand, will disappear, for you don't love justice. You will be shaken, for you don't love justice. And Hildegard, Hildegard's words could just as easily be spoken to the Harper government today. You do not love justice, Stephen. You love words like streamlining and choice and efficiency and accountability. You do not love justice with your omnibus bills and attacks on environmental regulations. It is clear you don't love justice for indigenous people, you don't love justice for all Canadians, and you don't love justice for the earth. And I really do think, Mr. Harper, that you thought this would all go away over the holidays, which as we all know is a bad time for politics as usual, but Mr. Harper, this is not politics as usual. This movement did not fizzle. The round dances are still happening at the malls, the rallies are still happening at the legislatures, the teach-ins are still going on, not just here in Canada, but all over the world. And when the World Trade Organization came to Seattle in 1999, back when I was in grad school, those of us who were there to greet them in resistance and protest had one slogan in particular, the whole world is watching. And Idle No More proves this again, the whole world is watching you, Harper. Idle No More solitary event, solidarity events are happening all over the world. Mexico, Aotearoa, New Zealand, Australia, Sweden, the UK, and it seems everywhere in the US, even my little hometown. The whole world is watching Harper and more and more of them are aware that you don't love justice. So this is the invitation. Idle No More has a history. It's a history that goes back to the time of the Transformers and the Creator and the sacred obligations between indigenous peoples and the land. It goes back to the first diplomatic engagements with the newcomers and to the necessary resistance to invasion when it came to that. It goes back to the great indigenous confederacies and the more modern coalitions built among communities. It goes back to the founding of friendship centers and to the creation of First Nation studies here at UBC. This is the history, and those of us who are not indigenous are invited into it, bringing with us our own histories, our own skills, our own traditions of justice. 
And so ultimately then this is about creating not just a movement but a community. And so I want you to do something right now actually, um, a first step perhaps toward accepting that invitation. So I'm gonna stop talking for a moment and what I want you to do is I want you to introduce yourself to two people you don't know. And I want you to shake their hand, give them a hug, feel really awkward with them for just a minute. So do that right now, two people you don't know. <laughs> I'm Andy, I'm Steven. Nice I'm just you. recording here. Good yeah. to see you. Hi. How you doing? Hey. Hi. Nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you. Chris, I'm Steve. Chris, nice to meet you. Good to meet you. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I saw good yeah. things. See, no, that wasn't so bad. <laughs> so just to wrap up, let me say this is a community in the making. So these are the people you're going to see in class. These are the people you're going to see at the bus stand, that you're going to see at the sub. These are the people that you're going to see at another rally. These can be your people, and we all need each other if this is going to work, um, if this is going to make the difference. But here's the deal. It's already too late. All of you are standing here right now. Um, for everyone really in Canada today, it's too late because you're already inside the story. You're already part of it, whether you know it or not, whether you accept it or not. And the late Caribbean historian Michel of Tuyo, he's one of my favorite writers, he famously wrote that you, when you're never more embedded in the story than when you think you're outside of it. And that's where we are. This is the invitation to wake up, to know that you're already inside the story, so now the choice is what to do about it. And I'll just end with some words from Cherokee writer Thomas King. He famously has really spoken into the silences of history here in North America. And in doing so, he said that, you know, here's the story of our people, here's the story of your people, how they came together for better and for worse. Here's the story that is your story. And he always says at the end of his writings, he says, do with it what you will, but, do, but there's one thing you can't do. You can't pretend you didn't hear it. So it's too late. You've all heard it. You're here. Do, it, do what you will. So I'm glad you met some people. Thank you for asking me to speak. Hi, Sapka, and thank you.